A New York man wrongfully locked up for 18 years finally had his conviction vacated. The Brooklyn DA's office says that there was a mistake with the photo lineup. Take a look at these two photos. The one on the left was the suspect in a murder, Sheldon Thomas. The photo on the right shows another man also named Sheldon Thomas. In 2004, police showed the first photo to a witness as part of a photo lineup. She identified him as being involved in a deadly Christmas Eve shooting. But the police went to the home of the other Sheldon Thomas who lived in the same precinct. They arrested him and that same witness identified him as the, the suspect despite him being completely different from the photo she identified. Thomas was convicted of second degree murder and attempted murder and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Thomas was released though on Thursday, having spent more than half of his life behind bars. Br Brian, you practiced in Brooklyn Supreme Court. What do you think about this? Yeah, I'm not surprised in any way, shape or form. I'm glad that Eric Gonzalez, the DA in Brooklyn, now has this review unit where they're looking at these cases. But I think the real heroes here are the appellate group that um, actually the attorney who led it was Bill Kasten with a K. He spent 14 years fighting for Mr. Thompson to get the case here. And thankfully, in front of the Chief Justice in yeah. the Supreme Court in Brooklyn, Judge Demick, he actually got it dismissed. But the fight here is from the defense attorneys, not the prosecutors. Terry, it made me think, you know, this, there's other people who are locked up for crimes they didn't commit. How do groups like the Innocence Project determine which cases to take on? You know, it's difficult. There are so many of these types of cases out there. What the Innocence Project does is they look at thousands of applications. You must be in the United States for one thing, and you have have to have DNA. You have to have physical evidence that shows you were not guilty. It's interesting. They don't take self-defense cases. They don't take DWI cases. So there's certain types of cases that they will not take. The main thing is, if they can't take it, they have a network of 71 organizations that will help you. So for instance, in New York, New York Law School has an organization that will help you if you need to uh, fight your case. That's my alma mater. Always doing good work. Well, there was a tense back and forth Friday between the man defending the alleged ice cream man murderer and a witness who's trying to pin a revenge plot on his client. Michael Keatley was an ice cream truck driver more than a decade ago when he was robbed of $12. He was actually shot in the process, which left him disabled. Now, prosecutors allege that he wanted revenge against the thieves and plotted to kill them. On Thanksgiving Day of 2010, police say Keatley gunned down multiple people at a home, killing two of them. But they say he targeted the wrong group. Keatley's defense claims that he was misidentified as the suspect. There was a previous trial that ended in a hung jury. And then on Friday, a man who worked with Keatley in the ice cream truck after he was robbed testified that he often heard Keatley talk about his need for revenge. The defense brought up, though, a deposition of David Beckwith that he gave previously that seems to contradict what he's saying now. This was a question. I guess what is your, pl your particular plans? What is your particular plan? Mike was going to go up there and go boo, and you would come up behind them and grab them or kidnap people. Did you have any specific plans? Your answer, yeah, to act like police officers. That was your You're plan. You're saying my plan is mine. It wasn't my plan. What, did you say in a sworn deposition that it was your plan? It was, it was his plan to do all this. Didn't you say in a deposition that it was his plan? My, he, your, I, I, I'm not an plan. English professor. Your plan. Right? Yeah, you're saying me, I'm the one to devise all this. This is bullshit. I didn't devise anything. And to finish off today's show, we're putting the spotlight back on Brian Koberger. This is the man charged in the murders of the Idaho Four. This week, his defense team is allowed to add one more seat to that defense table. Koberger is represented by Ann Taylor. This is the chief of the Kootenai County Public Defender's Office. She's tasked with helping her client escape murder charges related to the stabbing deaths of four Idaho college students in November. If convicted, Koberger could face a life sentence or the death penalty. Now, there's no confirmation that prosecutors are actually going to seek the death penalty, but Koberger's defense team wants to be prepared. And last week, Taylor filed a motion requesting a death-qualified defense attorney to join their team. The judge approved that motion, letting Koberger's defense be an official party of three. So, Terry, what factors do the prosecution consider when they decide whether to seek the death penalty or not? 
Well, we're in the state of Idaho, and there actually are 11 factors that they have to consider. These are the aggravating factors. Obviously, the mitigating factors can outweigh those, but here I don't think that's going to happen. They just need one. Some of them include multiple murders, the fact that they're especially heinous, atrocious, and cruel, and he can be a threat to society. He has a disregard for life. All of those, those are four right there, I think will apply in this case, and I think that is why the prosecution is considering it. They don't have to signal right now what they're going to do, but at some point before the trial, they will signal and they will seek that death penalty, I believe, uh, in this case. So, well, well, Brian, the Koberger motion to appoint another death penalty attorney, it's barely two pages. It has a lot of statutes, constitutions. Can you make heads or tails of it? Yeah, so let's go for the easier ways first. Fifth and 14th Amendment, due process in federal and state courts. Sixth Amendment, my third favorite one, right to counsel. And eighth, um, against cruel and unusual punishment. But the standards here that are statewide, they do talk about the standards for qualification for the defense attorney, making sure that they are good enough to be able to do a death penalty case. You don't want someone who has been doing misdemeanors uh, for the last six years to step up to a death penalty case. And the other one, the rule 61000, whatever, whatever, the administration of indigent defense, does highlight a very key issue here, that you can't just have one death qualified attorney. You actually need to have two. I would say as someone who's done felonies, homicides, violent crimes, misdemeanors. Misdemeanors after a couple of years of practicing, maybe it can be just yeah. you. But felonies and more serious crimes, you need to have, I would say, at least two highly qualified attorneys to help do that case. That's why you see one person do openings, another person often do closing arguments. Yeah, well, he's building in a team. Terry, Brian, you're both great. I wanna thank you both. I wanna thank Brian's newfound mustache. This has been a terrific show. And everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We're going to see you next time as we discuss justice in America.